This is the book by Jeff Hawkins, A Thousand Brains. In this video, I will recommend why you should read it. The author, Hawkins, has an extensive background in tech. He founded Palm, which led the portable devices market. And in addition to this, he has a long and deep neuroscience track record. The combination of these two fields allows Hawkins to make some groundbreaking progress. If you have an interest or have been following the development of AI, then this book will interest you. However, to whet your appetite, he says that if you survey the current state of AI, we should remove the I. That is to say, remove the word intelligence from artificial intelligence. Are you intrigued? Watch this video to find out more. Before I talk about the 1000 Brains book, I want to say a little something about what we're up to. We are passionate about education and the future possibilities of tech. And for that reason, we have created a series of courses and videos exploring tech, AI and data. Please subscribe below to see more of our videos in your feed. Please also like to help spread the love. And by that I mean send signals to the algorithm to help make recommendations. Now, back to the book. If you've read Bostrom's Super Intelligence, you will know what a challenging read it is. I thought I would never get to the end of it and was encouraged to keep at it by being held to account. Thank you, Nick, if you're watching. You will not struggle to read Hawking's book as he keeps the book flowing with plenty of references should you wish to take a deeper dive at specific points. For clarity, these are my takeaways and you should probably read the book to form your own opinions. I will cover AI, slippery slope, movement, cortical columns and 1000 brains. Let's begin with AI. As I alluded to in the intro of this video, the author suggests that we need to take the I out of AI. Let's unpack this. We have narrow AI. We have seen blistering progress of narrow AI to the point that we're making unprecedented investments in this sector across the globe. Our best humans have already lost at games such as Go. We have excellent solutions for financial vetting, facial recognition, medical diagnosis, and much more, much more. So what is Hawking's problem? Remember, he comes from a deep neuroscience background and therefore compares silicon-based neural networks and deep learning to the brain. The brain is learning all the time. Our current AI systems are not. So if we want to improve the current AI, we have to stop and get data, train the systems again, which can be time consuming and costly. We can't do that with the brain. And an example might help illustrate the point. Let's take a coffee cup we recognize, but this one has a new logo that we've not seen before. We would not be confounded. Simple stuff, right? Now, see this image. We have a stop sign with a sticker stuck to it. And here's the problem. The AI no longer sees a stop sign. Suddenly, the AI has to drop its confidence levels on what it has detected. The features of the sticker skew the algorithm. The image is no longer a solid match to previous training data it has seen. We might move from a 95% prediction of having detected a stop sign to 60%. Depending on the thresholds we have set up for an autonomous vehicle, we might now be in danger of ignoring the stop sign. Yes, this is an edge case, but you want to be in a car that can't reliably stop at a stop sign. Similarly, a facial recognition system can be fooled if you hold up a photo of another face. Please don't get me wrong, our existing AI stuff is producing great returns, but according to Hawkins, to call it intelligent is too much of a stretch. 
So it seems we are left with artificial in search of intelligence. The second point I have stolen from debating illustrates the author's idea. The slippery slope fallacy occurs when we argue that A means Z will happen, but without having justified the interim steps B, C, D, E, etc. The fallacy might state this. We create intelligent machines, step A, and we will surely lose all our jobs, step Z. I have said nothing about how we get to Z from A. Instead, I have operated on your biases and have probably pushed on something you might already half believe. What is this image? By the way, I show this to kids in schools, so no pressure. Can you tell me what this picture is? Take a few seconds if you wish. Ready? Got your answer? OK. If you have said the Terminator, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Killer Robots, please stay behind for detention. The answer is lazy journalism. Remember, we are on the slippery slope. Science fiction writers, commentators, and a few journalists love to scream that it will be the end of the world and we're all doomed. So think about our first point. We need to remove the I from AI. Before we can go from A to Z, we need to get past B, C, D, etc. Yes, we can create drones to kill people, but that is not the Terminator. Our narrow AI might be able to play chess, but it can't steal a set of sunglasses and ride a motorbike. I don't wish to mangle Hawkins' book. He says you need to learn constantly to be intelligent. It would help if you recognize where you are and what surrounds you to enable you to move forward and achieve your goals. You need an array of sensors for touch, sound, light, and you need to be able to locate parts of you with respect to your body. For example, where is the coffee cup? with the logo in the room, and where am I in the room with respect to the coffee cup? Hawkins suggests that pretty much everything we do needs reference frames, and more importantly, we need to predict what we are going to find based on these reference frames. If something does not fit, we must learn. For example, if the coffee cup has been moved slightly, we will need to adjust our reach. With current AI, we might get as far as recognising the coffee cup, simply because I've been trained on many coffee cups. The brain, however, is way past working out this type of stuff. We are further down the line. The brain has determined if the cup is empty from its weight and whether or not it will spill based on the angle it has been held at. Do you see the difference? you are highly likely to have seen the cup with the AI. Now compare this to the brain. The brain has already added the sugar and you're drinking the coffee. The brain has solved many complex problems along the way. And most likely adaptations were required to fix anything that failed outside the initial predictions. We're not talking about speed or the ultimate perfection. Narrow AI can hit us out of the ballpark for some things, but it's not intelligent. The brain is learning all the time. The cup might be cracked, the light might be very dim, and we have to make up for what our eyes cannot see through touch. With the brain, we're operating in a multi-sensory framework. The intelligence here is the ability to adapt to learn about any changes that do not fit in with our predictions and still move forward to attain the goal of a nice cup of tea. You might say, aha, I have seen all those Boston Dynamic videos, but can those robots appreciate real life sounds or the changing weather, which might compromise their goals? Do they know the difference between natural light and artificial light? What would happen if we blocked some of their sensors? What would happen if they met a situation they had not been trained for? Hawkins uses Mars as an excellent test for robots. 
Will they adapt and get on with terraforming, or sit around for the next human to input to solve a problem? But of course, we want our Mars robots to get on with the work and not to take time out to sip tea. To finish off this point, before we get to Arnie the Terminator and his sunglasses, our current AI needs a lot of eye. The third point is movement. The notion of movement was a big reveal for me. Suppose we take our first two points. Our current deep learning systems are static. New data and new training are needed to keep the system functional. In our slippery slope examples, if you think again, the notion of movement is there to be seen. To pick up a cup, we need to move an arm. We move the arm with respect to our body and the cup. We need to locate the handle and vision will only take us so far. Our fingers need to feel the edges of the handle and then apply grip. We have moved in several ways. The arm and hand have moved through space, but they also have moved in the reference frame. We predict when contact will be made and whether or not the cup will be hot. The temperature estimation suggests moving along a plan, a bit like a pilot's checklist. If cold, keep proceeding. If above a certain limit, we need the checklist items for the hot cup. In short, our intelligence requires us to move in time, space and mental models. We have many reference models, all up for testing against predictions. For example, will I trip with this hot cup? The answer will come from prior learning. We need to scan the room and to identify hazards to determine a potential tripping incident. Our intelligence requires movement, whether physical or mental or across models. Our fourth point is cortical columns. We just demolished AI and suggested that Arnie won't happen for quite some time and that movement is pivotal to intelligence. So the question therefore has to be, well, how does it all work? Hawkins begins his book with an explanation of cortical columns. In the newer and larger part of the brain, the neocortex, there are about 150,000 of them. In his book, he refers to these as sensory motor modeling systems. This means that we don't have a single model of the world. Instead, our brain can establish thousands and thousands of models, all using reference frames. Remember the cup relative to the body? The cup handle is relative to the rest of the cup. Pretty much everything we do is handled through reference frames. Now for the magic. Hawkins, his team and many others concluded that these cortical columns were very similar. The brain has not had the evolutionary time to create entirely new structures. Therefore, cortical columns are replicated across the neocortex. If we have the same architecture duplicated many times, could this mean that we have the same algorithm running in each? The whole book suggests that these cortical columns work with reference frames and that we conceptually move around these frames. So we need to stop a moment and reflect. Vision, hearing, physical movement and even thought processes and therefore intelligence operates similarly. This is a big ask. The author refers to a memory trick to make his point. I once attended a Dale Carnegie seminar. They managed to get the entire room to remember a long list of items. The trick was simple. To begin, all you had to do was imagine walking around your house and at various locations, you would mentally place an item. For example, at the entrance, a cup. Next to your television, a cuddly rabbit, and so on as you plotted a path around the various parts of the house. Next, you would mentally walk around your house following the same course for the recall. For example, at the entrance, we have a cup. Next to TV, we have a rabbit and so on. All the delegates could recall 14 to 20 items using the memory technique. Pretty impressive, huh? Let's unpack the memory trick. We use a house as a reference frame to anchor knowledge through movement. That word again. We use movement to mentally walk around the house, to visualize objects, and we recall them. This is so much easier than to do 
than stuffing words into our short-term working memory. We have just seen how memory can operate with reference frames. You will need to read the book to discover more fascinating explanations. Our fifth point, a thousand brains. So far, we have discussed AI, slippery slope, movement, and cortical columns. Our last item is the 1000 brains implication. The author covers a lot of ground here about how we might create intelligent AI and he makes a compelling case and that we need intelligent machines. Now I could go along with his futurist track in the next part of this video, but I wish to keep things tight. For the moment, let's get back to his notion of the brain. The cortical column the common algorithm and the mentioned ideas to help explain intelligence. Hawkins' framework for intelligence and the mechanism for processing are not inherently evil. Handling a scorching crack cup is not a bad thing. How is it then that we expect a slippery slope that leads us to a bad tempered Arnie bot? The author has convinced me that it does not. You need someone to set the parameters and goals to achieve an evil Arnie. This should be a relief to us all. This slippery slope does not need to happen. Hawkins gives an example of an intelligent machine. Imagine a tiny robot that can enter the cells to destroy poorly shaped proteins. The machine has to learn its environment and take action. It has to constantly adapt and learn. Sensory inputs and reference frames are used to deal with proteins that are harmful to us. This is what we mean by avoiding lazy journalism. Intelligent machines do not have to be anthropomorphized into the evil machines of our imagination. If the neocortex suggests that it can be agnostic to both good and evil, what on earth is going on with us? The author suggests that it is down to our genes and old brain. The survival of our genes has meant that our drives and motivations are pretty much there to be influenced. We could grow crops for a better food supply or conquer someone else's territory. Both strategies provide better food and therefore both are acceptable as far as our genes are concerned. The complications arise when we need to balance all the possibilities. Working as a collective is good for us and our genes, and therefore we choose to work together socially. Killing our group members is terrible and frowned upon. We accept, do not kill as a social norm. Yet killing another group's member can be justified. We have just entered a conflict between the old and new brains. One is rational and slower, and the other is faster and emotional. If a lion comes at you, you need to be quick and emotional. If you're dealing with global warming, you probably need a long-term strategy. We can be really dumb on a massive scale, despite our intelligence. It gets a lot more complex than what I have tried to explain, but the book is an excellent introduction to the broader areas for discussion. It is time for a summary. 1. Despite all the hype, AI is not as intelligent as we think. 2. The slippery slope to a world run by Skynet and thousands of Arnies is not the apparent final destination. Intelligent machines are neither good nor bad in themselves. 3. Movement. Incredible as it might seem, movement is a considerable part of our intelligence. 4. Cortical columns. The evidence suggests brain theory requires a general algorithm using hardware and wetware. 5. The 1000 brains. The neocortex and by implication Intelligent machines are not good or bad. Our genes push us. Genes want to be replicated and are ambivalent to how this is achieved. We need to design AI to be good. Therefore, the critical message is this. We have it all 
to play for. I was entertained, informed and educated by Hawkins. I thoroughly recommend this book. I certainly learned a lot, especially around how neuroscience will impact the future of AI. Perhaps you could put your comments below so that we can continue the discussion. I hope you have enjoyed this review and found it valuable. Please subscribe, like and share, then we can be sure to meet up in the next video. Thank you for your attention.